Okay, uh, so cool. I think uh, everyone is here. <laughs> and I think, raise your hand if you haven't been to one of these workshops before. <coughs> Okay, All right, cool. So then I guess I'll briefly introduce myself again. Uh, my name is Pamela. I work at Google. My primary job is to support the Google Maps API. However, I really like a lot of our other APIs. Specifically, there's a few GData APIs that I love, which is uh, why I'm going to be talking about them today. So that's what we're covering today is the GData APIs, also known as the Google Data API. Um, and then uh, for the last like three days, we've been doing a lot of the JavaScript APIs. And there are ways to access these APIs in JavaScript, but there's, people generally tend to access them with server-side scripting. So that's why we paired it with the uh, PHP tutorial. OK, cool. So what are we talking about? We're going to talk about GData API protocol, two specific examples, calendar and spreadsheets, because I think they're the most useful. Uh, also talk about JSON briefly, and then we're going to do a code lab, which should be I just did it over there in like five minutes. So. Um, all right, so bringing back our mission again, in case you guys forgot it, because I want to make sure you guys memorize it as well. Google's mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Uh, OK, so obviously a lot of our APIs serve that mission, because um, the thing is that a lot of our products have information, either user-created information or information that has been indexed by Google. And in the case of GData, a lot of times it's user-created information. So you have stuff like Google Documents, um, where people are creating documents, creating spreadsheets, creating presentations. Um, you have Picasa Web Albums, that's like, you know, it's like Flickr, it's photos, people are uploading photos. Um, so we have all this information that we're letting people upload um, and put on our servers. Now our goal at, with these APIs is to make that information accessible to other people to do what they want with it. The list is out of date. Huh? The list is out of date. Oh yeah, I know. This list gets out of date like every day. Um, we, this is like the list of all of our APIs, but it's not really because we add more APIs like every one or two weeks. <laughs> so uh, I, I usually have to update this list and I haven't updated it since last, uh, since last fall. Um, so the full list of our APIs is at code.google.com slash more, and you can check them all out. This is just a subset. And the thing is, when I originally gave this talk, we, it was only like this long, and then like we added, like we doubled it in like the six months after, like the very first time I gave this. So uh, yeah, it's definitely increasing at a rapid rate. I'm personally gonna send out an email and be like, look guys, we need to stop releasing APIs. There's too much stuff for me to play with. I don't have enough time. Because like the charts API comes out, I wanna play with that. The iGoogle themes API comes out, I wanna play with that. I'm supposed to be supporting the Maps API. You know, there's too much going on. So I think we should stop it. Just, uh, just so that I do something other than make mashups. Um, so we can categorize the APIs a little bit because we so we've started looking at a lot of the JavaScript ones. We looked at the Ajax APIs, Maps API, the gadgets, and Open Social. Um, we do actually have some SOAP APIs. If you guys remember, um, SOAP is basically an HTTP API, except uh, you have to send a lot more complicated XML over the wire and then get back XML that's a lot more complicated. <laughs> that's the way I like to word it because I don't like SOAP. Um, but we do have. AdSense and AdWords SOAP APIs, and I actually am using the AdWords SOAP API right now, and it's not that bad, so. Uh, we did have a search SOAP API, which most people know about. Um, it was deprecated in favor of the Ajax search APIs. Um, so what we've been moving to lately are all of our GData APIs, because um, the great thing about that is they all have a common base, and then they kind of extend off this common base. Um, so then it's really easy to quickly like generate new documentation for the new client libraries. So then like if I have an example for some code in like spreadsheets, then I can quickly adapt that to work for calendar um, because they they all the XML is very similar across them. So that's what we have here is the GData APIs, um, and we have woo. <laughs> and we have a few more XML based API. We have KML, um, which is the market language for Google Earth, and then also sitemaps. Um, our XML, and that's what you define through your site. Um, so what we're talking about today, though, is these GD, GData APIs. Um, so talking about this GData API protocol, why we wanted it, um, basically here's the deal, right? So 
this is like the Web 2.0 world, right? So in Web 2.0, um, it's all about APIs and it's all about matching, right? Because the thing is, so let's say, let's say there are multiple products, right? So let's say we have, uh, we have Picasa, and then we have Flickr, and then we have some other photo site, right? What's a photo site that doesn't have an API? Smug mug, photo bucket, don't know. All right, so let's say we have another photo site, right? So let's say Picasa and Flickr, they both have APIs, but this other photo site doesn't have an API, but it has like an amazing user interface and it basically like builds in Photoshop to the UI. And you're like, oh my god, that photo site is so amazing. I just want to use it all the time, right? But then you have to think of yourself, okay, they have a really cool interface, but they don't have an API. So what happens if one day I put all my photos on there and then I realize, wait, I don't really care about Photoshop. I, you know, I'm not that good at it. I should probably code instead. And then you're like, well, what am I going to do? I decided that I'd rather use Flickr or Picasa, or there, and there's no API on that site. So what you're going to end up doing is writing some sort of screen scraper, or you're just going to be sitting there at your computer, like saving all the images to your hard drive from this website, and then manually like uploading them somewhere else, right? <coughs> so the motivation for just having an API to provide access to data like that is that um, it what makes it like customers like more willing to use your service because I'm more willing to use uh, I actually use Flickr as my favorite photo service but I know at any time since Flickr has an API and Picasa has an API I could go and switch over to Picasa and it'd probably only take me like a little bit of coding on the weekend um, so that's really cool so I one of the motivations for having APIs like this is making your customers feel comfortable making them feel like okay it's fine if the UI isn't exactly what I want if the service is exactly what I want, they have an API. So at any time, I can just go and modify it and do make it do what I want it to do, right? And if any time, I can go and like take my data out of it and go put it somewhere else. So it's kind of counterintuitive to provide APIs in order to make migration easy. But I think in the end that um, people tend to trust you more if you give them way easier ways out. <coughs> so. Um, but yeah, so anyway, so we need to get people access to data. And so what do people want? They want feeds. So this is everyone's all about feeds now, like RSS feeds. You want to be able to like subscribe to something in your Google Reader or easily sure. pass into any feed reader service. You also want to be able to query your data. I mean, this is Google. Google's all about searching. We usually have a pretty good search. I must use Google Groups. Very but um, other than that, we have a great search. <laughs> and uh, so uh, people want that searching mechanism. Uh, available to them because nobody wants to continually rewrite search, right? Okay, I have this feed and now I want to search through this feed. You're never going to be as smart as the Google search, so you know, we just admit that, right? <laughs> so we want to do, be able to do queries and we want to be able to get stuff back. So that kind of covers, if you think about it, um, sometimes like, so RSS could cover a lot of that usage, right? Um, so RSS, like, you know, it's read only and you could like append parameters to the end of the RSS uh, in order to do queries. But the other problem is that we also, that's just getting the data. Uh, we also want to be able to post data and create new data from a thing. Let's see, we think that the calendar UI sucks. Even though I don't think it sucks, and I know the people working on it, I think it's actually awesome. But let's say we're like stupid and we're back in the days of, uh, okay, try not to make fun too many people So, okay, so let's say we just don't like it, so we can just rewrite our, <laughs> we can just rewrite our own UI from scratch, right? We can even make it a desktop app. Some people like desktop apps, right? So you make a desktop app that lets you enter calendars, right? So we need something that's kind of like RSS, uh, but also lets us put data in. So this is why we have the GData protocol. Um, so here is some of the products that support it, and this list is probably also out of date. You want to come up with any others? Um, so Google Base, which is, we're actually going to be using that later during the code lab. Um, and Google Base is a, kind of a generic database-y like thing. Um, it holds various like types of items in its database. So there's a lot of personals in it. If you guys are looking, you know, for a date. Uh, it's Valentine's Day today, actually. Yay, happy Valentine's Day. Okay. Uh, <laughs> And then, you know, it has recipes, car listings, all kinds of stuff, and then you can put any kind of arbitrary items in it. Um, the only thing about Google Base, it is all, everything you put in there is basically publicly indexable. Um, so a lot of times you put something in Google Base expecting that other people will want to index it, right? Um, so a lot of, like, local maps listings are in there as well. Uh, then we have Blogger. Obviously, that's for blogging. 
um, similar to WordPress if you guys use that. Google Calendar, hopefully, do you guys all use Google Calendar? Yeah. Yay. Okay. Uh, it should, especially with Google Apps, it should become like really easy to schedule stuff. Because you know those emails that you send around and you're like, when are you free? I don't know, when are you free? And when, everybody send when you're free. Okay. And then like you do this complicated matrix. I mean, Google Calendar, you just like load Google on the Google Apps thing, you'll just load everybody's calendars and be like, oh, that's when they're free. And you just put it in there, right? Things that used to be really hard become really easy. So that's just a plug. But okay, so Google Calendar. Um, Google Code Search, I've talked about this before. This is good if you're looking for examples of like using a particular function in a particular language. Uh, you can actually use Code Search and you can specify what language you want to search in and what like, string you want to search for. Um, and you'll come up with like great examples. And it's just all the code that Google has indexed online. <coughs> Google Notebook, um, Google Documents, as well as spreadsheets, um, Picasso web albums, that's photos, and then we recently added YouTube. Um, so everybody loves YouTube. Yeah, YouTube has actually used to have a non-GData API, but then you know we bought them. So now they have a GData API. We are traffic <laughs> Um, so here's some examples of why you'd want to use an API, and I've kind of talked about a few of these. Um, pretty much any of these APIs, migration is always an example, particularly for something like calendar, right? So somebody like Google Apps, right? Let's say like an entire domain is already using Outlook. So by giving, they're, they're much more likely to use Google Apps for their domain if they're like, oh, well, there's an API and we can just go through and create a script that's going to automatically uh, move all of our Outlook calendars <coughs> over to the Google Calendar, right? So that's that was a big thing, as well as also for the Google Documents list, right? Because trying to get people to convert from like using Microsoft Word to uh, using Google Documents, they'll be much more likely to do that if they could simply, you know, uh, zip up all their files in one big zip and then use some script that somebody writes to upload all of them, right? If they have to sit there in the interface and go file, upload, <coughs> file, upload. I actually did that before the API was around and I'm really sad. Um, <laughs> so that's, I mean, that's another huge thing with migration and that was like one of our number one requests that was coming from Google Apps customers, like let us upload things in mass via your API. And we're like, okay, here you go. Um, and then, then we have also just with any of the APIs, it's like publishing to your own website. So like with Picasa, I want to put my own photos on my website, so then I like create this cool slideshow of them. Um, and then with calendar, I might have a specific way I want to view my calendars on my website. Uh, synchronization is a big one for Google Calendar. Um, so some people still do use Outlook, right? And that's fine. They just want to be able to sync between uh, Outlook and Google Calendar. Um, so there's a lot of scripts that actually do that as well. And then, as I said, uh, most of Google stuff are web applications. Some people for desktop applications. So we have .NET client libraries for our GDA API, APIs, and then you can actually create uh, desktop apps. And do you remember how many downloads the uploader got? I don't know the specific number. I thought it was like 10,000 in the first Yeah, day so our, one of our colleagues um, who supports the, the Doclist API, he created a desktop uploader um, with just the .NET client library, and all you had to do was like, drag like, from something from your desktop into this little space on your screen. And it ended up getting 10,000 downloads in the first three days it was out, yeah. or something like that. So obviously <coughs> desktop applications are popular. Um, so yeah, there you go. This, those are some examples. What was it called? Um, his thing? Yeah. Uh, Google Documents Uploader? It was yeah, something pretty generic. Docs <laughs> Uploader? Uh, yeah. I, uh, I beta tested it. Yeah. It's probably on this computer. Um, it was very neat. It allowed you to um, basically drag all of your doc, dot doc, uh, dot xls, and dot PowerPoint files, and um, just all of a sudden make them available in Google Docs um, online. Right, and you can and all the code for that is open since he created that as sample code. Yeah. So it's funny that you can create something as sample code that people actually use. It's kind of nifty, right? Um, so here's a specific example of of a use case. Um, so this one's Calgoo. It's a software that works both online and offline um, that allows you to sync iCal, Outlook, and Google Calendars all in one view here. The other thing that's cool is that you can use your calendar offline. Um, so this is something that most Google apps don't offer yet. Um, they probably will one day use <coughs> Google Gears, um, which we'll talk about tomorrow. Um, but for them, since they don't in the meantime, we have these apps that work offline, work on the desktop, 
probably save the data to the desktop somewhere, wait until you're online, and then sync it back up. So that's a big use case as well, because there's a lot of people who may not be uh, online all the time. Okay, so now let's actually get into like what the protocol is. Um, so how many people here know what RSS is? Okay, and who can like describe the elements in an RSS feed? No, not you, no. Someone else. Anyone? Yeah. Like name some of the, the, the elements in it. Right, right. What are the Yeah? Yeah. 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 Right, right, right. Okay. Very good. <laughs> wow. Cooper, you're going to have to do that from now on. I'm going to do that from now on. <laughs> All right, right. So RSS, um, it's a type of XML, and it, it basically looks like, we're going to see a slide of it, but it's XML that starts with a channel, I believe, and then has item, uh, and then an item has like a title, author, description, date. description, date. Okay, so that's like the basic of RSS. Um, but then, so RSS, so that is a way to take your data and make it so that it's easily readable by other people. So that covers being a syndication format. Um, however, it doesn't have any capabilities <coughs> for actually creating data on it. It doesn't have anything with authentication, which is important because think about a lot of um, our services require authentication for private data. Because it turns out not everybody makes wants to make all of their data public to Google. Hmm. I don't know. Well, go for you. <laughs> I know. Everyone's always like, but Google's going to steal my data. Well, maybe. Um, and then we have, <laughs> so RSS doesn't really have queries built in. I mean, you could probably <coughs> hack it, but we really want like a real way of doing queries um, that's not a hack. And we want a big thing also, optimistic concurrency. Does anyone know what that is? From class. Which class do we do that in? Database class? Operating systems, too. Operating systems? What? Okay. <coughs> Anyone? Uh, when two people try to change something together, you know, there should not be any ambiguity. Uh, right. Exclusion. Right. Okay. So yeah, it's a case where um, where you have multiple people trying to edit the same thing at the same time. Right. Oh, <laughs> you can go. Me? Want me to throw it? Well, I'm not gonna throw it. Um, <laughs> So the problem with like with a lot of the Google products is that we have things that are collaborative, right? So Google Docs, you can collaborate on your documents together. Um, same thing, Google Calendar, right? And then when you add the API, like if it was just the UI, it'd be fine, right? But when you add in the API, you never know at any time who could be doing what to the data. Um, so we want to make sure that we don't override data without knowing it um, or without knowing what like the last one was. So there's actually, we'll see later that there's actually a capability for optimistic concurrency in there. Um, and people have actually requested that we take it out <laughs> to make things simpler. Yeah, it's a feature request. Because if you know you're the only one. All right. Yeah, we'll, 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 I'll show you later. OK, so let's just compare <coughs> RSS to Atom. Uh, there's some things that, so right, so RSS didn't have what we need. So we used this other protocol called Atom and then built a bit on top of that. Um, so you can see the, the elements that I colored in red, those are actually shared across the feeds. So look, they're both XML, <laughs> and then they both have a title, and they both have a link. Uh, but even the link isn't the same, because here you see the link, um, the first child is the URL, whereas here the URL is actually an attribute named HRF. Mm. Um, so you see a lot more <laughs> attributes in, um, in Atom than you will in RSS. So you can see a lot of them are actually kind of the same thing. So content type equals text. Uh, that's another thing you see, the type. Uh, in, in Adam, you'll see this a lot, the ability to specify type. Um, so that allows them to handle stuff other than text. Because um, think about Picasa, photos are not text. Unless you want to like upload all your photos as ASCII pictures, but I hear that's not really in anymore. <laughs> so yeah, so we have description, similar to content. We have the date, so pub date, updated. You mean, on some of these things, you're like, well, why don't you just call it the same thing, like, honestly? But, you know, whatever. If you get to make a protocol, you call it what you want. 
Um, so both of them do have like an ID here. Um, item similar to entry. Uh, we have author, except I think the author has more information in uh, in Adam has name and email. Wow, that has managing editor. I never even looked at that. So yeah, so you can see our assistant Adam. <laughs> hey, I'm Adam. Uh, our assistant Adam are pretty similar, um, but they differ by enough to make it important. Um, so you can think about Google Reader. Google Reader has to parse any, probably any RSS reader probably parses both of these things um, because right now I don't even know what's offered more RSS Adam. Probably RSS still. RSS still. But Adam is, I think, being used yeah, more. Adam's more. better to find too. Yeah, yeah. So RSS, like Adam, is actually like a standard. Mm -hmm. RSS is RSS a little sketchier. Yeah, <clears throat> but it's newer. That's the thing. Right. Well, RSS 1 and then Adam and then RSS 2. Yeah, so you see RSS version equals 2.0 as well. So there's different versions of RSS. <coughs> um, so this is just a, more of a comparison between here. Um, but you see they, ha they have similar things there. Um, but you see a big difference here. <laughs> link, rel, alternate type, text. So it's a little more complicated to really get the link out. But it's okay. You can write a little function to do that. We all have it. Um, so right, so we have this generic thing now, this Adam, right, and so that has the title and the content, but a lot of our stuff, we want to be able to give more information than that, right, and we don't want to just like stick it all in the content. Um, so like thinking about like a calendar event, a calendar event, uh, think about the UI, you want to know where the calendar event is, you want to know who is attending, uh, you know, we want to know when it is, right, and you don't want to just like write that as just unstructured data into the content because then think about it because all the time you're going to want to parse that out right you're going to want to just have just that where data and i guess we could do it as like comma separate or something like that but it would get annoying pretty fast right so you want to be able to extend um the atom in order to contain these uh elements that are specific to like a, a certain type of service right so for example so we have these things that we call uh element collections or kinds um, and they don't necessarily have to be um, for a particular uh, <coughs> product. Like we actually, so GD Who, I think we use in the majority of our GData APIs. Um, GD Where is probably only in Calendar. It, uh, I actually think it's in Picasa too, because we added geotagging. And it could also be in YouTube. Definitely in YouTube. Definitely in YouTube. Okay, cool. So yeah, so these are just kind of things that are. Um, generic kinds that various services might want to use, and then we define like so. The GD who I think has a a name underneath it, an email. I can't remember what else. Um, so they they each have their their attributes. Uh, so yeah. So that's really useful, right? So when you're coming up with it, so when you're coming up with like a new, so there's let's see, there's a new Google product, right? So make up a product. I can't make one up because I like, I know what's coming up. <laughs> Uh, Anyone? What's a new Google product? Google OS 10. <laughs> <laughs> Google, Cap. Google Text Messaging. Google Text Messaging, right? Well, we do have the what the XMPP, but okay. So Google Futon. Google Futon. All right. So Google Futon, right? <laughs> now we want to know about this huh? Futon. We want to know where it is, and we want to know who it is. Now instead of us being like, well, let's just make up this new this new element and just decide what it's going to look like, we can look at all the other data APIs and be like, sweet, there already is a who element, there already is a where element, right? So it means it's a lot easier when we create new data APIs to design it um, because we can share common elements like that. The who. So is there, like, is there like a parent <coughs> API that everything shares and like originates from? Well, Adam. All right, so well, if you look at the, so we can just look at the namespace here. Um, so that's the thing, RSS doesn't even have a namespace, <laughs> so you can't really like look to see what's defined in it. But so we have the namespace for Adam, and then do we have any, so this one doesn't have any specific kinds in it, but when we see an example it does, you'll see that there's a namespace for them. Um, so the basic stuff is from Adam, and then the kinds are from uh, various other namespaces. So you can, you can actually check out their pages, see what they have. The common kinds have their own namespace, GD. Right, okay, so yeah, so there's that one schema like for there, GD. GD who. Yeah, exactly. So these are all the GD ones, but then there's also like, I have, so for G Calendar, um, there's ones that are just specific, so there's a namespace for that as well, and a schema for that. Um, 
So you have these ones that are shared, you have ones that are specific to the service, and then you have the generic added ones, right? So author, category, content, link, title, and then, so these are all the shared ones. Comments, think about comments, they're on calendar events, they're on blog, they're on photo. Um, who, where, when, visibility for private, etc. Because a lot of other things you get to set that kind of stuff. Um, so here's an example, example where you can see like the full XML. Um, so if you see, you look up there, uh, we define the GD namespace and we have a schema, schemas.google.com, you can look it up. And uh, then when we go down, we have a when, and a when uh, has, this must be a calendar event, yeah. Uh, when has a start time attribute, an end time attribute, and then has this lovely string in there. And uh, then we have a reminder, has a minutes attribute, <coughs> um, where, where is it, etc., 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 right? So you get the idea in there. And then we have the ones I was talking about, like just for Google Calendar. Um, Google Calendar apparently thinks that they're the only one that will have a color. <laughs> so you can actually, the cool thing is that you can actually set the color of events through the API. I don't know why you want to do this, but hey, for Valentine's Day, you could write a script that would go through your calendar. I don't know if you saw Google Docs today, but it's pink. So you could write a script that would go through your calendar and make all of your events pink. Or you could somehow convince your friend to like share the calendar with them and they could make all their events pink. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> and then the time zone is something very specific with calendar, right? Um, you see they have their own schema as well. Okay. Um, so the, G the GData API protocol is HP, right? So we can obviously do get, because that's what we're talking about, getting like the read-only data. Um, but then the really powerful stuff is the ability to make edits. So being able to create new stuff, update existing stuff, and delete, uh, delete stuff that exists right now. Um, and the get, you can actually get multiple outputs, and I'll talk about that later. Do you guys all know the HPP protocol, right? We went over that oh, yeah. yesterday. Raise your hand if you know it. Okay. All right. So, like, when you put a URL in the browser, that's doing an HTTP GET. Okay. Um, when you let's see, give me an example. Fill out a form. When you submit a file, like for us, a searching for something. Right. Well, for post. Oh, post. Yeah. Well, I mean, so that, you that day four B. Today's uh, sign in. Right. That did a post. Yeah, so when you're submitting a form, that often does a post, right? Um, <coughs> to somewhere on a server. And uh, a lot of these, like a delete and a put, so these are basically just, eight, these we call them like HTTP verbs, <coughs> and they're actions that you can take on like resources, right? So given a resource on the web, you can get the resource, you can post the resource, which actually creates it, um, you can put to the resource, which actually edits what's at that resource, and then you can delete that resource, which would just get rid of that resource entirely, right? And a lot of these things, post, put, delete, well, they require authentication, because you don't really want to let anyone do anything, because other, otherwise you could just be like, oh, HTTP delete Google.com. Yay! <laughs> I tried that once. Um, <laughs> right. So, with these four commands, um, pretty powerful. We do pretty much everything, right? So here's examples. Um, so if you actually looked at your um, your network data, like the, like the stuff that's going over your network, you would actually see uh, the the requests that are going over it. So you'd see like a lot of GET requests. Um, but then if you're doing other stuff, you'd see that as well. All right. So here's a GET. Um, so in this example, uh, well, usually when you do a thingy, you actually do, I always want to draw on this. <laughs> so you would have a, here. Oh, here, I can uh, raise it a bit. Well, whatever. So you see it says get <laughs> slash my feed. True. Uh, what you actually do is, like a full request would actually have a host in it as well. So it would be uh, like spreadsheets.google.com. And so they would just concatenate that together. So we're getting, um, in this case, I think we're actually getting a blogger entry. So that would be <coughs> blogger.google.com. So it's going to be like blogger.google.com slash man feed. So we send that request. 
And then we get back a status that says 200 OK. That's an HTTP status code. Uh, other status codes you might be familiar with are 404. <laughs> I got the brunt of that alcohol scented. <laughs> um, and then, uh, all right, so we get back to 200, so that means success, right? Um, Cap that thing. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, this? Yeah. yeah. I thought you were saying that I spelled No. <laughs> no. I really spelled. like this, though. <laughs> you don't like this? You can Dude, it. stop recording. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't going to look good. <laughs> Fine, all right. I'll play with a pen. Okay. So anyway, so it says 200 OK, right? So that's success. That's a good thing. Um, so we get back our feed. This is what it looks like. Um, it's pretty basic. It doesn't have any specific elements for this service right now. Uh, so it has an author, a link to itself, title, etc. right? OK. So now we want to actually, so as you saw in the last one, oh, sorry, I should point out. So that was actually the feed for this entire uh, blog. And it doesn't actually have any entries in it, as there's no entry element here. So it's kind of boring to have a blog with no entries. So obviously, the next thing we're going to do is create a, create a new blog post. Um, so this time, we're doing a post. So once again, we posted that, that URL. And we're going to send the full XML for the new entry that we want to create. Um, if you don't, at least in DData, if you don't send the full XML, if you don't like qualify all the namespaces, you're going to get an error, and it won't be able to insert it because it has to know everything. So in this case, we have to send the author, the title, the content. Um, there are a few things we don't send that actually get inserted in back when we get it back. So when we post to it, it'll go, it'll create it if it's successful, right? Um, reasons it might not be successful if you're posting to somewhere where you don't have the authentication for it, right? But in this case, we've probably sent our authentication details in with the post, and so we're able to do it successfully. We get back 201, another HTTP code. We've created it. Now we've gotten back an ID, and this ID is important, um, and this is actually what we're using for optimistic concurrency. Um, and we also get this edit link, and that's what we have to operate on um, if we want to edit or delete this thing later. Uh, and then they, they also stick in the updated time as well. All right, so this paid engine to this thing right now, it's like slash one slash one. So the next thing we're going to do is edit it, right? But in order to edit it, I need to know that edit link, right? And that actually refers to like a specific version of this. Um, so as long as I refer to that link correctly, then my, so I do a put, right? And then it'll be successful, 200 OK. And it'll show me the updated stuff. I've, I've changed that word right there. And if you notice, the version number right here, or sorry, the edit link just increases, it changes slightly. Um, so the deal is this, right? So let's say that uh, you edited a blog post, right? And let's say your friend is also screwing around with the API, and then they go around and edit the blog post, right? So the last, your, the last edit link that you have for the blog post is before your friend edited the blog post. So if you try and then make another edit to that blog post using that old edit link, you'll get, you know, permission or not, you can't do that, right? And that's how we enforce optimistic concurrency, because it says, look, you have to get, you have to go and get the most recent edit link, um, because if you don't have it, then that applies to us that you don't know that it was, it was edited after you got it. Now, the reason that people, um, some people would like an ability to turn this off um, is because that means that every time you want to form an action on something, you have to go and get its edit link, right? So that means instead of having one uh, HTTP action in order to edit a cell, you actually need two, because you have to get that cell and you have to edit it. Um, I think the biggest request for this is actually in spreadsheets, um, because there's actually a cell speed. So if you imagine that every time you want to edit a cell, you have to go and get that cell, and then go and update that cell. That means that's two HTTP requests for every cell. Imagine you have a spreadsheet with like 2,000 cells in it. So you've, you've doubled the amount of time that you needed in order to edit that spreadsheet, um, just so that you can make sure that you were the last one that edited it. And if you're the only one that has access to that spreadsheet, and if you just don't care, then you can understand <coughs> wanting to be able to turn off this feature. So that, that's that. Um, we haven't fulfilled that feature request, but I think we're kind of thinking about it. Because um, it does actually take kind of a long time to do 
operations on like thousands of spreadsheets. I actually have a script that goes through and does one, and you just sit there for like 10 minutes and watch the spreadsheets uh. update. <laughs> I think that's fun though, because I call it magic fingers. <laughs> All right, delete is really simple. Once again, we need to know the latest edit link. Um, and if it works, we get back at 200. OK. Uh, now we talked about being able to query and search. So every GData API um, can at least do one type of query. And that's using the Q equals parameter, Q stands for query. And that'll just do a full text search um, and give you back any of the matching entries. So in this case, we searched for this. And then it returned back the entry that had this in it. Because um, we figure pretty much every data API probably has some kind of text that we can search, right? Um, however, a lot of times there's you want to be able to do more specific searches for that. So I'll show you in the calendar and spreadsheets, like how we have very specific um, calendar searches or spreadsheet searches. Like imagine a calendar, you want to only search between this date range. And so that's something we allow for. And we make special query parameters for it. Okay. So I said we have the get, right? And I get I showed you the XML response. There's actually another response as well, which is the JSON response. And how many people have been here for my spiel about JSON? Really? Um, yesterday? Yeah, I don't know. I spiel about it a lot. <coughs> I just like saying spiel. Um, yeah. Can I start playing with this again? <laughs> okay. So, uh, now she's ready. <laughs> Take a hit off that. Dude, you guys clearly did not grow up with whiteboards as your parents. <laughs> you did? <laughs> I, I need to take that mark away. <laughs> there we go. Oh, but this has a laser. Okay, anyway. So JSON, right? Um, it's another output format, and there's actually a reason that is pretty cool and a reason that we support it. It stands for JavaScript Object Notation. Um, it's pretty lightweight when you compare it to XML. Um, it's usually slightly smaller than XML. Um, it's pretty easy to parse, um, just like any kind of data format, right? And it's easy to output as well. Um, let me just show you an actual example, right? Um, so what you see here uh, is it's basically hierarchical key value pairs, where the key uh, is a string. Um, and it can be with or without quotes, uh, as long as the string has no white space in it. So I could just write this without those double quotes and be the same thing. Uh, but it's got to be a string, but then the value can be a, another string, a number, a <coughs> boolean, array, or another object, right? So this whole thing is an object, um, and then like address, the value of it is another object, uh, and then like phone numbers, the value of that is an array. So you just keep on nesting and nesting and nesting this, right? Um, so it's pretty cool because it's incredibly powerful, right? Because given that, you can represent everything, right? I've yet to find something that I can't represent in JSON really nicely. Um, so if you're familiar with objects and hash tables, I mean, this is basically like a hash table, just um, a nice hierarchical one with a few data types in it. Um, now the really cool thing about it is that it is JavaScript, right? So this is the way JavaScript actually defines <coughs> its data. Um, so if you guys have been playing with JavaScript, I mean, if you look at it, um, like this is a way you define a JavaScript array and a lot of other arrays in other languages, right? Um, but this is a way you define a JavaScript object or hash table and then the, you know, the strings and the numbers. Um, so because of that, uh, you don't need any special parser to parse this. Um, basically, you know, you just make that thing that we saw back there equal to a variable and that's it. It's JavaScript. Um, and the really cool thing is that you can use this, uh, this JavaScript output to avoid the, the cross-domain issues with getting XML from another server. So remember, we'll talk about that, right? So does anyone remember the issue? Like, so let's say my spreadsheet is at spreadsheets.google.com slash panelsv.xml. If I have a web page, and let's say I don't have any PHP or any server-side scripting, what's, well, how am I going to get that feed? What's the problem with me trying to get it? You can do it. Right, and so why can't you do it with an AJAX request? You can't, you can't do cross request. Right, so remember we talked about that XML HTTP request object, and that's what you it's use California. in order to access XML that's on your own server, <coughs> but you can't use it to access XML that's on other servers. So that means every time I want to do some mashup that involves getting my, my public spreadsheet data from Google, I have to go and write a proxy to go and grab that data and then output that as XML on my own server so that I can then use it um, 
with an XML HP request call. So the cool thing about um, JSON is that what you can do is use the, uh, oh, now I need my, oh, I'm going to need a whiteboard marker. Uh oh, oh, snap. Okay. All right. I definitely put this on the board yesterday. But, uh, so, uh, <laughs> so, right, so remember we talked, so script tags. So I remember script tags, that's how you include JavaScript. So script source equals la 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 la. Um, so the cool thing about a script source is it can be from any domain, right? So I can go and usually use this to grab JavaScript from other domains, right? Let's see, there's a, like, there's a library called jQuery, and it's on jQuery.com, and it has a bunch of like nice convenient functions for making, um, well, it makes finding elements on your page easier. Um, <coughs> so I say I do jQuery.com slash jq.js, right? So that reads all these nice functions onto my page. I can use these functions, right? But the cool thing about that is I could also, let's say that there's data on a server um, about something, right? So let's say it's data about candidates. Um, we actually use the <coughs> candidate election mashup. So let's say it's on google.com slash candidates.js, right? And let's say all that's in that is just a JavaScript object that has all this information. So it's like Obama, cool, Hillary, woman, whatever, right? <laughs> yeah, see, I'm strongly opinionated. Um, so it has all this data, right? <coughs> so I just include this on this page. And let's say I just make this equal to a variable, right? So var candidates equals this stuff. Okay, so once I've included this and once it's loaded in, I can then refer to this candidates thing anywhere on my page. So the thing about this, as long as, a Google, uh, as long as a server outputs their data in JSON format, you can read it into your page just by using the script tag. So the other thing that is one more hack that we do is that uh, for the GData APIs, we let you uh, say, okay, you want the JSON output, but you also want to say callback function. Right? Because sometimes you want to be able to just dynamically insert this data at any point, but you need a callback function to know when the script tag is actually loaded onto the page. So let's say you okay, take callback equals call me. Call me. Okay. So what we do now is that it'll actually return that data, but wrapped in a function call. So as soon as it's actually loaded into the page, it will call this function and pass this data into it. So it'll call the function that you've already defined, pass the data in, and then you can play with it. Um, so you can go back down. So using that technique uh, with the JSON data, you can do all kinds of client-side uh, mashups with any of the GData APIs. Um, and all we do is we basically take our Atom XML output and we just have a technique to converting it to JSON. Um, it's not too hard to figure <coughs> out. The best thing to do is actually, um, let's see, I have a link to it. There's something called a JSON inspector um, that my colleague wrote. And it'll let it'll just let you view the JSON output for a feed, and so that's the easiest way to figure out how to parse it. But here, so here's an example of parsing it, right? So this is actually is a Google spreadsheet. Um, so this is what the feed looks like, right? So we have feed entry, just like with the out of thing, title, um, title type text, and then has this dollar t value, which is actually kind of like the um, internode first child for Adam, for the XML. Uh, with the content, <coughs> type, etc. Right? So then when we're parsing this, um, so here's our script tag. So we're reading from spreadsheets.google.com, blah, blah, blah. Alt equals JSON in script, and callback equals list tasks. Okay? So we told them we want JSON, we want you to call list tasks when you're done. Right? So when this loads in, it will call list tasks, and that root you see there is this. Right? So then we can say, okay, we want root.feed, so we get that. Then we want feed.entry. So we get that. Uh, feed.entry, for those who are familiar with hash tables, is the same as saying like feed, bracket, quotes, entry. Um, that's how JavaScript uh, can iterate objects. So then we just iterate through this, because this is actually an array, so you see the brackets there. Iterate through, and we grab the title, content, with the dollar t, et cetera. OK. So that's the basics about the generic GDAT APIs. Uh, let's see, so it's 9 o'clock now, um, so I'll just whiz through and show you examples of more specific APIs, but we've seen some of this already. So we've seen some of the calendar examples. This is the UI, obviously. Um, so what does the calendar API let you do? Each of the APIs 
has a couple different actions, a couple different types of feeds you can access depending on what you know that product is. So with the calendar one, you can list all the calendars for a user because the user can have multiple calendars. You can get their calendar um, in a couple different views. You can add entries, um, add events, edit events, delete events. Um, there's a couple different feed types, right? So people have public events, they have private events, right? So if you're authenticated, you can go and get the, the private events, right? So that's a type of feed. <coughs> if you're not authenticated, well, you can only get the public, so you're going to have to request it. If you try to request some of these private events and you're not authenticated, it'll just say no. <laughs> no. Um, and then the other thing is that there's a couple different projections. It just, just means what information um, the result contains. Because it may be that if you only care about when they're free busy, like if you're making a scheduling app and so you don't want to like download extra XML, right? So you only care about when they're free busy, so you'd say like, oh, I just want to know when they're free busy. Um, so then it would just return like from this time to this time, they're, they're busy, etc. Um, so you can actually see this is what like a URL looks like. Um, so if you want like everything, private slash full, if you just want the basics, uh, public slash basics, and special query parameters. So these are really fun. These are really good. Um, so the one that's probably the most useful that I've used the most is the future events parameter. Does that mean, because like, most of the time people don't care about the past, right? The past is gone, it's over, can't change it. So, uh, so we have this future events parameter that will always just give you the events starting from the present on. Uh, I think that's the most commonly used one. You can order. Uh, by last time you modified, start time, it's not as useful. Um, the other thing that's difficult is that Google Calendar lets you specify recurring events. Now sometimes you want a recurring event to just be represented as one entry. Sometimes you want just a separate entry for every single recurring, like instance of a recurring event. Um, and so we have some parameters to let you do that. I think all three of these are <coughs> Um you can have a sort order, ascending, descending, and then um, start min. So let's say you not only do not care about the, the past, let's say you also don't care about next four weeks or whatever. So you can start min at a certain time as well. Um, so this is a quick example of creating an event. We have slightly more fleshed out um, headers here. So we have the host that we're talking about, and this time we're sending an authentication string here. So we're going to need that in order to create this event. Um, and you see we've got the GD1 as well as the other stuff. Um, now something that I've only briefly mentioned is that we have client libraries. So the thing is that you saw like the XML and you saw the headers in the last one. People generally don't like to keep writing like all this XML and headers in their code from scratch um, because it, it's, you know, it's prone to readiness. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of annoying to write the namespaces all over, stuff like that. So we've made it, we've decided to make it easy by offering a lot of client libraries. And the client libraries just wrap on top of the raw HTTP operations, right? And so they just provide like convenience <coughs> functions for logging in, for creating entries, and for deleting entries. So they've become like infinitely easier to work with. And Trevor actually worked on the PHP client library for spreadsheets over the summer. So if that's something you're interested in using, he would be the one to harass. And calendar and provisioning. And oh, okay. <laughs> Did you? All right, all right. Well, because I worked, on, worked with spreadsheets, so I harassed you about that one. But <laughs> so, and a lot of the PHP client libraries, uh, which are in the Zen framework, Trevor worked on. So he's a good one to harass about those. We also have Java, Python, .NET, and recently we actually have a JavaScript client library for um, calendar and blogger. Now, JavaScript is a little weird that we have a client library for it. Can anyone think why it's weird? Well, I mean, unless you use Rhino or something like that. Because what? Unless you use Rhino. Yeah. Like, uh, like a rendering engine. It's not a server-side script. Right. So you're saying the problem is that you can't do server-side actions. So the problem is you can't, like, create and edit and stuff, right? So the, the JavaScript client libraries are actually fully functional, um, but they use this incredible <coughs> iframe hack. Um, so it's really weird, they actually, I haven't looked into too much, there's a YouTube video about it, but they use this like giant hack and it only works <laughs> on, um, let's see, we don't support Safari, so it works on Internet Explorer and Firefox, mm -hmm. and it only works if you have an image on your page from the domain of your page, <laughs> like an actual image tag. Um, so it's definitely, it's definitely a hack, but it's kind of cool when it works, because you can do everything from JavaScript. So if you guys are interested in how that works, you should look up this YouTube video about it when we launched it. So pretty interesting. <coughs> so yeah, 
Um, so we have various client libraries. So this is a Java client library. Um, so here we just say like, okay, this is the feed that we're using. Um, here we're creating a new entry. Um, so this is Java style, right? So we say new event entry, set title, uh, add an author, create a start time, add the time. Um, and then we just send in our credentials. I mean, this is the real reason to use client libraries is the credentials and the authentication. You don't want to write that stuff from scratch. Um, so here we just set our credentials. This isn't actually his password, so don't try and hack him. This is our colleague. Uh, and uh, then we just insert the entry, right? Um, so the client libraries make it a whole lot easier to work with these things. Um, and I highly recommend you use them. The only problem is that you need to have support. Like for the PC client library, we realized that it won't actually work on the Luja servers because it needs uh, DOM XML support. Um, so, but if you have your own server, then it most likely will work on it. Um, we'll also be providing a, a server for the contest, so right. you don't have to worry about any of this. Yeah, so if that's something you want to do, just let us know. We'll look you up. <coughs> um, so then a couple examples of uh, mashups. RoboCal, it's kind of cool. It'll, you give it your credentials, it'll read your Google Calendar, and it will um, use this like text-to-speech engine to read them to you over the phone. In a robot voice, I assume. <laughs> so you like, you have a meeting at five. Go to your meeting. Um, <laughs> but, you know, if that's what you're into. Like my robot voice, yeah. Um, this is the one I did. That um, this uses something called uh, web content or calendar gadgets, and they just put little icons in the top of your days, and then you click on the icon, and you get like this. Um, you get like a web page that loads in there, kind of a mini web page. Um, but that, that actually is a gadget. Um, so this was just it was analyzing uh, news stories every day and just telling you the top uh, keywords for that day. So this was right around when Anna Nicole Smith died, so she was top of the news. And for some reason, I was scraping Google Images for the images, don't tell. But um, for some reason, I kept getting back like the kind of pornographic images. <laughs> I remember oh, when no. it like, what was it, what's his name, not Obama, Osama, when he was like in the news, um, for some reason I kept getting these weird kind of pornographic pictures of him, which is really strange. But, uh, but anyway, so that's why you should not scrape Google Images. <laughs> Because uh, it just <coughs> give you naughty things. But there is like not a setting to. Uh... No, but not when you're scraping. <laughs> you shouldn't scrape. Okay. Um, so then we have the spreadsheets API. Um, this is a personal favorite of mine because I like you use a spreadsheet as kind of a generic database, um, but the one that has a nice UI. So think about it. Think about like you're a coder, right? So you don't mind interacting with the database and like interacting with like PHP, MySQL, and stuff like that. Or think about like you're a professor. Your professor, oh wait, we're computer science. Well, imagine that your professor isn't a computer science professor, right? Um, and he like, you know, he's had, he has his grades and spreadsheets, um, and he wants to be able to do some things with the grades and insert them into another system, right? So you're like, well, you could set up this whole database system with MySQL and give him a front end to edit, or you'd be like, all right, we'll use Google Spreadsheets, because it already has the front end UI for editing for those people who aren't coders, but then you, in the background, can do your little coding thing um, and create some like magic scripts for him. So I think it's cool because it's a collaborative database that has a nice front-end UI for non-coders. The only thing that problem with it is that you shouldn't use it for like more than uh, like 20,000 cells maybe. You know, because it loads into the data, into the UI. So you don't want to hurt your browser too much. So kind of like a mini database. Um, so we have a couple different feeds. We have spreadsheets, worksheet, uh, lists, and cells. And those are both for the, just for a worksheet. Um, this is using, uh, this is just the XML, blah, 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 it's standard. Um, this is actually the JSON inspector that I was talking about. Um, so you guys should uh, try that out, that's pretty nifty. It'll just display like the hierarchical nesting of the, of the objects. Um, oh, we went straight to examples. All right, <laughs> so this is something I wrote for a professor last semester, and the professor <coughs> was in a coder. Um, so we stored all of our video game assets for GamePipe. Um, we had them all on the server, and then we had this spreadsheet that students would edit um, to say like what the status was, right? So we needed we needed something that um, was collaborative because we had like 30 students working on it. Um, but we also realized that it was getting really annoying to go through and like update the URLs. So these are actually all hyperlinks because they're using the hyperlink formula. So it was getting really annoying to like update these hyperlinks because um, the TA was doing it. It was like taking them hours. So we actually we wrote it. I wrote a script that would go through. And look at like the name here, and then like the action here, 
uh, or like the sorry the suffix here, and it would go and actually look on our server, and then it would like uh, uh, figure out the URL to it, and then it just update all the cells of the hyperlinks. So that was cool because then I, had, I was able to have a script that took care of the part that was kind of painful for you know humans to do, but then uh, you know humans could edit the stuff that was important to them, so like the status of it or who was assigned it. Uh, and that was using Python, um, and there's now a Python client library. Hmm. Uh, here's a math <coughs> sign up that I did. Um, I think this one was also with Python, and then I read it with PHP. But you see the point. It's kind of like what we're talking about now. They have the spreadsheets forms. You don't even need to do this. You can actually hmm. use the spreadsheets form and then just hack the uh, the, the HTML of it. Um, for this example, you just fill it up form, geocode it yourself, and add it to a spreadsheet, right? Uh, then there's one more. This is a client side one. So those other two were server side. Uh, this one uses the JSON output and it just loads it into a page and then creates a map from the JSON output. Um, and you can get there's actually I made a wizard for it. So if you do have a spreadsheet with a latitude longitude information in it, you can make a map from it in approximately two steps. So that's pretty cool. And then you can like study the code because now I don't even write code anymore. I just copy and paste like my old code and like, tweak like two variables or something. <laughs> It's pretty sweet. All right, so th that's the end of the slides. Now let's get to an actual code. Uh, let's see, where's my gadget version? All right, cool. Um, so you can get to uh, both the slides in the code lab are linked to off that uh, Google Workshops at Google Matchups.com page. So you guys probably all want to start with computers and go there now. Oh, did anyone have any questions? Other than what's the URL? Yeah. I have That's a question. Zero. Do you yeah. like to be meta? Do I like to be meta? Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's meta again. So oh, so like the, that's the code that I showed you earlier, the spreadsheets JSON code. If you actually look at the code of um, of the code lab here, it's pretty much almost exactly that code. <laughs> so I just created a. So look, you can see I actually created a, a spreadsheet. Um, so this is just a view of the spreadsheet in uh, Google Docs, and I published it, and then I just used that code that I showed you on the board to uh, create a gadget for it. So go to googleworkshops.googlemashups.com. <coughs> You've made both an ordered and unordered list. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> I thought about it. <laughs> So if you go down to the bottom, you can see uh, there's a link to the code lab and to the slide set. Um, probably you just need the code lab because I put some links, the links in there that you need. So let's see. So open. <coughs> Where's my whiteboard marker? I didn't take it. The Jones in for it? I'm Jones in. <laughs> I thought it was red. Number two. Did our thing just okay. taste purple for a minute? Huh? <laughs> Thanks for coming. All right. Uh, so the code lab. All right. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to use PHP since that's what we learned earlier. Um, but we aren't going to use a client library since, as we discussed, uh, we can't use it with current PHP configuration on the Um But luckily, there is a sample for Google Base um, that's written all for PHP 4. So we're going to download that sample and then modify it. Um, and as I said, I was doing it in the back of the room during the presentation, so it took me um, sure. So uh, the first step is actually to sign up for the base API key. So I didn't link to where to do that, but you can just go to uh, code.google.com. What's step seven? Um, I, I didn't read it. That's a star. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right, so go, if you go to code.google.com uh, and then go to base, the, uh, you can sign up for the API key right <coughs> here. Just check that. Um, I gave them the, I'm not actually sure if we have this information anymore, but I gave them scf.usc.edu, since that's where we're going to put it. And then you just do your signing up. 